are we starting with this A week? nice you guys we review. Are both wrong. Oh. <laughs> we never start with we reviews anymore. Well, no, we do sometimes. Maybe next week. I don't know. I don't know what week it is. Ooh. But this time, it's time for the YouTube comment of the week or month, depending on when we next do this. I feel like that needs like a punchy theme intro. <laughs> YouTube watch, yeah. comment of the week. It's the comment of the month right now. Let's call it the comment of the month. Comment of the month. So this comment is from River Williams, and it's on our latest Psy Guys live clip, the Talking to Ghosts ones. You guys remember that? I remember I it very well. Very, very good. It says, I have to watch these podcasts on here uh, on YouTube and then also over on Apple Podcasts because I zone out and don't hear half the things you're saying. <laughs> Loving the podcasts. <laughs> I must say, keep up the good work. I think that's rather nice. A YouTube view hey. and an Apple Podcast view. Double the listens. That's lovely. I think everyone <laughs> should do to my that. ears. I think everyone should listen. I highly on encourage this. Platforms. I highly encourage this. If listen. you're watching on YouTube, I recommend you don't pay attention and yeah. then pay attention when you re-listen. Or a bet, <laughs> here's a better tactic for everyone to use, right? It's a fun game that you can build into Sci Guys. I think you should watch it on YouTube, but have the audio come through both Spotify and Apple at the <gasps> same time. Give that one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hell if you can yeah. do Big that, brain thinking you right win. here. You win. <laughs> Send us a video of you doing that every week, and you'll eventually win something. Shall you start the show? I shall start the show. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co hosts, Jamp and Luke Gufford. Hello. Well, hello there. This week, we're talking about life in a jar. Ooh. Life in a jar. Well, I'm trying to think. There's no. literally no pun there. It's literally just life in a jar. No, I know nothing to do with life or jars. You have no idea. Yeah, well. Unless it's a Simpsons episode that you're referencing. No, that would be life on a tooth in a... Oh, it's a tooth. Yeah. In a Petri dish. A little pe- yeah, that's yeah. a very good one. Yeah. Anyway, that's not... That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's not I what I'm talking about I was talking today. about, even though I was very wrong. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, another skill of mine, along with being able to know the title of every Simpsons episode within the first sort of <laughs> three to five minutes, um, I can also understand which Simpsons episode someone is talking about, yeah, even if they're yeah. giving an awful, yeah. awful description. You know all the wrong iterations of the <laughs> yeah, episodes, yeah. yeah. I know them so well that I can even <laughs> I can tell them even when you're wrong. Uh, no, so I was on TikTok the other day. This is relevant to the story. I was on okay. TikTok the other day. And as, as, as you do on TikTok, I was scrolling through. Yeah. And I saw this experiment, hmm. this really interesting seeming experiment um, that really caught my eye about uh, people creating life in a jar. And you know me, I was like, well, that seems... That seems a bit um, preposterous. Yeah, a little bit preposterous. That was literally what I was going to say. <laughs> seems a little bit preposterous. Um, but let's look into it and see what happens. So I had a look into it, and there is a kernel of truth to this story that I saw on TikTok, surprisingly. So that's what I'm here to tell you about today. The story of the scientists that created life in a jar. <laughs> so why don't we get right into it? What is life? Oh, well, oh, I had a, a really question. interesting definition of life once, which was <laughs> that... Life is a naturally evolved system which takes advantage of... Oh, wait, no, because it might not be naturally evolved forever. But life is a system which takes takes advantage of energy vectors, where placing a small amount of energy in one specific way results in a larger amount of energy out. And it's also a biological system. I I just thought that was cool. It's cool. It's cool. I've never thought about the fact that we all try and put a little bit of energy in and get more energy out than we put in to a system like an engine. It's really cool. I like that. (laughs) Okay. So uh, life, as we have uh, come to realize, uh, is a slightly difficult thing to describe, wouldn't you say? I mean, Luke's definition was interesting. I'll give you that. But I don't Mm. think it necessarily covers all forms of life um, specifically. You know? Okay. I apologize. No, it was, uh, you don't need to apologize. It was very good. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that you can't define life, Luke. I'm just saying that in general, it's a very, very difficult thing to define and we have trouble doing that. So the thing is that we think of life as being a property that something has. Luke is alive. This desk is not alive. Um, How do you know? You don't know. Okay. (laughs) 
The desk, I'm pretty sure, is not alive. I think we can just <laughs> ignore the desk. You can ignore me. Here I am going. Home. You don't know the can't desk say is not alive. not alive if you are also simultaneously saying that life is really hard to define. <laughs> what, what but if your I definition of, de- of, of life includes desks, we can define it enough, apparently. Dear Lord. Okay, so we'll get to why a desk is not alive in a bit. I can't believe that's a sentence I need to say, but we will get to it in, in a oh, bit. Oh, I can't wait to learn. <laughs> Well, you'd learn quicker if you didn't interrupt me so much. So, <laughs> as I was saying, we often think of life as a property that something has. Um, either that or we use the word life to describe all things that have that property. So if I wiped out all life on Earth, you'd still expect, you know, the water and the rocks, um, the volcanoes, and I suppose also the desks to generally be fine, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> generally. Gener- well, it depends how I wipe out all life, you know? Yeah, I was going to say, I'd like to see a method of wiping out all life on Earth that preserves desks. <laughs> <laughs> um, a virus that uh, attacks non de- Wait, hold on. No desk. Okay, right. I don't, know, I don't know why I need to clarify that the virus doesn't attack desks. As of yet, scientists have not found a virus that... <laughs> the 2022 desks. pandemic wiped out all desks. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, you guys have really got into my head already. No, so my point here is that <laughs> uh we we think of life as being a property or um a way to describe all things that have that property. Um would you guys agree? Ye- Probably. Yeah, yeah maybe. Okay. <laughs> yes is the answer I'm looking yes. for. Yes, very good. So um, I wasn't sure if it was a trick question. It wasn't a trick question. It wasn't <laughs> at all. Uh, we think that's the case, but actually life is really more of a process than it is a property. Um, and Luke kind of touched on that with his sort of definition. We define life generally by describing the properties that living things have and sort of using that as a benchmark. So um, a good example of this, I say example, a good sort of analogy for this I found um, I say I found, I came up with it myself because I'm a genius, um, <laughs> is soup. It's something we've spoken about before in the podcast because it baffles me to this day. Yeah. Um, we all know what soup is. We all, you know, we all, if I say, hey, I had some soup, you, you'd know what I meant. Um, yes. Yeah, some cereal. No, yeah. oh, okay. Or Here's- the sea. Stop. Um, <laughs> Some melted ice cream. Oh, man. I Guys, didn't know I, you I went to the sea, Curry. God, I am, I, <laughs> I am this close. I'm In this a close. pandemic, you're cancelled. <laughs> so we all, we all know what soup is. Um, we can quite easily uh, tell what is and is not soup. Right? If I show you this, uh, for the listeners, I'm holding up my iPhone. Is this oh, soup? I'm going to guess. Yes. Not soup. You're right. This is not soup. But ding, if, ding, I ding, show, ding. if I was to show you a bowl of, um, I don't know, uh, gazpacho, would, what would you say? I don't know what that is, so I'm going to lock in, not soup. <laughs> That's soup, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if, I was to, if I was to show you, let's, let's just pretend that didn't happen. We'll rewind a sec. If I was to show you a bowl of minestrone, what would you say? Would that be soup or not? Yes. Yes, it's soup. Oh my God, okay. Wow. Well, I don't know, man. It's all called soup. I mean, okay, look, the fact that you've got difficulty telling whether desks are alive or not really did not bode well for this soup question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know why I expected this much of you guys. but um, Okay, so my point here is that we can all quite easily say what is and is not soup when presented with a bowl of soup or a bowl of not soup. Um, <laughs> however, it is very difficult to come up with a definition of soup that is meaningful, comprehensive, and only includes soup and doesn't exclude um, any kind of soup. What I mean by that mm. is that uh, a definition for soup is difficult to is kind of difficult to come up with because either it, either it's so broad that it doesn't mean anything, like cereal is soup and the sea is soup, or it's too specific <laughs> and excludes uh, specific kinds of soup. Yeah. So soup is a hot brothy that that in, that excludes all cold soups. So. Coming up with a comprehensive definition for soup is difficult. In the same way that coming up with a comprehensive definition for life is difficult. Mm. Because if you have if you if you have a specific definition of life, that might exclude something like viruses. And there's still debate on whether viruses are alive or not, in the same way that there's debate on whether cereal is soup. You know? The it's, lines of soup are arbitrary. Well, yes. Yes. Uh and the thing is, the lines of life are n- I think a lot of lines are arbitrary. Arbitrary. Because here's the thing: you, viruses there's debate on whether those are alive or not. And if yes. life was a meaningful, sort of a really, really meaningful thing, inherently meaningful in and of itself, then we'd expect there to be quite 
definite lines between what is alive and what is not alive, mm. you know? But somewhere between rocks and Luke, you have a virus. <laughs> <laughs> somewhere in between? Somewhere in between, I don't know. <laughs> oh dear, I need to put my mask on. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, are you guys understanding me? That when we talk about, um, when we talk about life, when we sort of define life, we define it um, as sort of a description. We define it descriptively, basically. Yes. So that does bring me on to my next uh, my next session, which is the properties of life, which I kind of want to run. <gasps> we learned this in school. Yeah, we also learned it in I think our I learned it, third I... episode. Uh, Undead pigs. Yes, we did. <gasps> yes. Zombie pigs. No, that wasn't. So, I don't. Undead pork. Undead pork. That's it. I That's remember it. those episodes. <laughs> that I named. You wrote it. <laughs> you wrote it and named it yeah i wrote it and named it i don't know i remembered what was in it no we spoke about the signs of life in that episode which was a long long time ago almost mm. two years coming thereabouts up yeah so let's have a refresher and uh so, this, like, miss, mr mr Gren or something mm. is like the way to remember it there's some kind there's some kind of acronym wow. you're sexist for one thing i think mrs Gren. yeah yeah. So this is the thing. I went from GCSEs to even higher than that. Um, GCSEs are the lowest. I'm no aware way. of that. They, we've gone. I've gone from GS, GCSEs and upwards um, to sort of find these definitions. And actually, there are a few more. Um, they're kind of different uh, between different places that I've looked. So the issue with this is that, again, not all kinds of life have all of these things, but most of them have most of them. If that makes sense, yes. To be, yes. to be alive, you need to have um, you need to have most of these properties. Yes. Uh, so there's movement, so they can move around. Basically, mm. they can go from one place to another, or change where they are, or change where parts of them are. In some sense. Ooh. Well, then, what what about seeds that are floating on the wind? They they move and uh, they are alive, but they don't. I understand that you said that they don't all have all of them, but like. <laughs> Is that moving or is that not moving? It's moving using the wind, but it's, ooh. I mean, <laughs> is it moving? I don't know if it falls into the definition of moving because it's it's designed so that it moves. Like it's it's. Oh like yeah, yeah. I suppose the yeah, function the, of it uh, enables I, movement. Yeah, I suppose the thing is right. Uh, me deciding to pick up a rock and move it from one place to another. The rock is not designed to move, unless it said move on it. Right, but. <laughs> But then it would need to... Animal pick me up and move me. <laughs> that's what seeds do. Um, you're thinking of seeds, guys. That's what you're... You're confusing rocks <laughs> with seeds again. I know they're similar. And then the rock grows into a big rock plant. No, no. No, that's a seed again. That's a seed. Ah. Yeah. Um, no, but and that's what seeds... picks up a seed. <laughs> <laughs> ah, dear Lord. That's what seeds do, though. Seeds do have... Um, seeds are covered in... And basically something that says, move me, which is fruit. Often it's uh, <gasps> by animals, moved and then excreted elsewhere. Of course. Yeah. So Luke, you are almost right, I think, if you squint real right. hard. Cool. <laughs> I'll collect my honorary degree. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sci Guys University. Oh gosh, Sci Guys U. Can't wait for it. Okay, what's R? We're getting there. Okay. Uh, R is reproduction. reproduction. Well done, Luke. Sorry. Um, How did you know that? Making more of yourself essentially. So that could either be a cell um, uh, going through um, mitosis and splitting into two mm. or meiosis and splitting into two, or um, it could be something else making, oh, that is it. Um, making babies. I forgot about a that human. one. human. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was like, what do humans do? What's that? What's that all about? Um, <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, mitosis. Bigger things that make uh, little things, you know, like mm -hmm. adults that make children. That's what they do. Mm. Uh, so that's reproduction. You guys know what that is. Uh, sensitivity. Now that's not uh, being a snowflake. Snowflakes are not alive, as far as I'm no. aware. Um, that's basically being able to respond to st a stimulus. So if mm -hmm. I was to flick you in the face, you'd probably be like, Ugh. stop stop you move no. away or if i was to uh start oh, shocking looks yeah i've done two ah, there, you go. there you go if i was to start shocking luke's chair he'd probably be like ouch this hurts me mm. i don't want this and he'd get up and move away again with the moving yeah well it's hard to it's, mm. responding to stimulus it often i will involves remain moving. here <laughs> in pain <laughs> <laughs> it often involves moving so um there's also growth so you can basically increase your mass 
um, your dry mass usually mm-hmm. is is how it's described. So that's basically if you take out all the water, you've got more more stuff in there because increasing your wet mass could just be taking in more water, which isn't really doing much. It's like filling you up mm-hmm. like a balloon. Um, but you need to. It, it's sort it's sort of a permanent increase. So you know you can't just suddenly be child sized again. That that increase in in size and mass is permanent. So, other than growth, um, so that's um, Mrs. Uh, what do you say, Mrs. Gren? Mrs. Gren. Yeah, Mrs. Gren. So um, then there's respiration. That's basically breathing. Um, essentially, let's call it that. But that's um, it, it's more than just breathing. Uh, it's it's essentially chemical reactions uh, that uh, break down um, molecules to give you energy to do stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exploiting energy vectors. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, there's also excretion, which is basically getting rid of things that are bad for you. Poopy. There is that, but a lot of that is undigested food. So it'd be also getting rid of, um, so there's urea. We make urea urea in our body and we excrete it in urine. I was thinking, would something like sweat be excretion or like mucus? Well, no, because mucus, uh, so mucus serves a lot of purposes. In your nose, um, mucus catches stuff along with the hairs. Um, so mucus isn't doesn't really have anything in it that you want to excrete and get rid of. Mucus is just kind of, the reason that you have a runny nose when you're ill isn't because you're trying to get rid of all the mucus. It's mm-hmm. because your body's like, let's get a lot of mucus to um, sort of help fight whatever is going on yeah. with your body. Um, and with sweat, that's more of cooling down. Mm-hmm. And that falls under um, homeostasis, which um, I think is kind of another thing that you expect life to do. They uh, sort of, life is supposed to have sort of a boundary between itself and everything else. Mm -hmm. It's often described as kind of like, um, I think it's basically, I think an open system. I can't remember which one. Basically the the idea is that life, it's got kind of a boundary between itself and everything else. It's got a limited size um, and it keeps itself sort of um, in balance, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So your body stays at a relatively the same temperature. Um, in order to stay alive, um, you need to keep relatively the the sort of same amount of salt and water in your body. Um, so that's sort of what homeostasis is basically maintaining an equilibrium um, despite outside conditions. So if something external throws that out of whack, your body kind of counteracts it. Yeah. To maintain the balance. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so. Yeah, and excretion is basically like you. Sweat isn't really, yeah, like I said, sweat isn't really getting rid of anything bad. That's more just kind of, you know, getting getting yeah. yourself nice and wet so you can cool down. <laughs> usually, <laughs> uh, and then there's uh, nutrition. That's um, absorbing nutrients. Basically, you guys, you guys get that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Once you a should week. get more, Luke. I, I've At noticed you a look week. a little scurvy. A little scurvy. Just a little bit little you got a little scurvy with you so those are the sort of properties of life that's probably what you'll be taught in school generally Mm -hmm. um but i also found some other interesting things so i found the seven pillars of life from daniel e koshland jr he uh basically wrote or published this um i guess it's an article small it's a short paper in 2002 where he basically describes um his idea for seven pillars of life because like i said we don't have like a solid this is a this is a short description of life in the same way that we have a pretty good description of what I don't know mass or energy are. So it starts off with a quote, which I'm going to read to you. It's a bit of a long one, but it's actually quite interesting. Um, <clears throat> After many hours of launching promising balloons that defined life in a sentence, followed by equally conclusive punctures of these balloons, a solution seemed at hand. The ability to reproduce. That is the essential characteristic of life, said one statesman of science. Everyone nodded in agreement that the essential of life was the ability to reproduce, until one small voice was heard. Then one rabbit is dead. Two rabbits, a male and female, are alive, but either one alone is dead. At that point, we all became convinced that although everyone knows what life is, there is no simple definition of life. Ooh, that's so good. Yeah, it's great, right? I read that. I was like, wow, that's good. That's good. <laughs> because, again, that's what really got me thinking about the soup. Um, because rabbits made me think of rabbit soup, which got me hungry. Mm. But after that, I just started to think about how it's really bloody difficult to describe a lot, to give a definition for a lot of things, despite the fact that all of us pretty instinctually know what is and is not, you know, one of those things, what yeah. does and doesn't fall into that category. So, um, Daniel Koshland, he or Daniel Koshland Jr. I don't know what he wants to be called. Junior. So Junior came up with... 
So Junior uh, then went on to talk about his seven pillars of life. So the first pillar is program. I'll run through the pillars, um, all seven of them, then I'll give you brief descriptions of what they are. So the first is uh, program, then improvisation, and then compartmentalization, mm -hmm. and then energy, regeneration, um, and then adaptability, and seclusion. So those are the seven pillars of uh, life, according to Daniel uh, just call him Junior for now on because I don't want to remember his whole name. Uh, junior. <laughs> uh, no, Daniel Costland Junior. So program, he basically means, um, I guess, DNA is essentially his idea of what program is. Um, it, obviously, this, this can exist in other forms. Um, the, the great thing about this, these sort of seven pillars is that they don't necessarily apply specifically to life on Earth. They um, can apply to other kinds of life. But he says that basically you need a program. You need some kind of code, something that um, describes uh, describes the entire thing, mm. which for us is our DNA. Yeah? yeah. It's our sort of genetic mm. code. For a virus, that could be RNA. Some viruses have RNA instead of DNA. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's the program. If it was, if let's say um, we had artificial intelligence that we just, just sort of decided that was alive, that would be its sort of base code. That would right. be its sort of pr uh, program. Yeah? Yes. Yep. Then you've got impro improvisation. Uh, essentially, um, it just means that um, you need to be able to change the program in order to continue living. So mm -hmm. that would be, I guess, evolution, essentially, ah, is improvisation. You're, you're shaking your head there, Luke, but this is, that, yeah. is genuinely, that is genuinely um, the example that he used. The idea is that um, it's not, life within one single you're think you might be thinking small here one single organism right. i was thinking more like creativity yeah no, some so, kind of way to like be inventive or you know improvise to survive so there is one later than that this i i the way that he's described this i think is not intuitive for most people mm -hmm. but um yeah so there's improvisation um that's essentially if you think of life as a system or as a process mm -hmm. um rather than one individual organism yeah. improvisation is basically what evolution is it's slow improvisation if you've got um say if you're not able to access some kind of uh resource like some kind of food because um suddenly it is slightly higher up say the trees are slightly taller mm -hmm. um you'll need a longer neck to reach that and then suddenly you've got a giraffe over like over a long like period nine of time foot neck <laughs> yeah suddenly over uh, <laughs> millions of years you have a giraffe um yeah so that's that's what improvisation means in this context it yeah. means basically being able to on the longer scale, adapt to survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, interesting. that though, because that suggests that I mean, giving the the, the, the description of improvisation uh, meaning evolution, and evolution, to our understanding, is an accident that happens by 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 not complete um, re repl replication of the um, the code, the underlying code. Um, Th that suggests that his definition of life is not a definition of life, the thing that, that like the like the thing that is alive. It's a definition of life, a part of the universe, because the mm -hmm. the fact that the code doesn't always get replicated um, is a function of I don't know what it will be a function of. But maybe it's a function of entropy. Maybe it's a function of the fact that mistakes can be made in our universe, and so life is a function of the universe in that des description rather than. Rather than describing things that are alive. Well, this is the thing. I, I remember what I was saying about life being a process. So I think describing life as a process is more describing life as a function of the universe rather than describing organisms individually or even really yeah. collectively. Mm. Yeah. Because I think this is something that we really that um, I think it'd be really interesting to get into this episode, which is kind of why I want to do it. Is the idea that the way that we think of life and what life could actually be are two very different things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah because we like to think of ourselves as being apart from the universe as something separate, but really we're not. In fact, this is something that really wound me up the other day. I saw this on TikTok again, because I'm spending all my time on there. I think it was Hank Green. There was a question of um, what is something you know, um, but you know, you don't like, you know, it's true, but you don't believe it or you find it really difficult to believe, right. even though you're fully aware that it's true. And I think he was saying that like, basically everything is chemicals. Even I am chemicals. Uh, and specifically, I am chemical reactions. And yeah, like, I get it. I mm -hmm. know that every living thing is just kind of chemical reactions, but I don't like it. <laughs> and it's very hard to reconcile with how we view life, you know? We're all just made up of tiny little atoms. Yeah, 
But specifically, yeah. specifically atoms that well, it, the thing interact is interact with each other in particular ways. Yeah, yeah. There, life is kind of a series of chemical reactions that um, predicate towards replicating themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of that's kind of what's going on, really, with life. It's just chemical reactions that beget more chemical reactions. Yeah, um, self sustain. Yeah, and whereas generally we think of life as a, a thing, like a like a fish is alive mm -hmm. or a rabbit is alive, but really when you sort of zoom out a little bit, life is more sort of this consistent process that is happening in this, in the same sense that there is sort of the water cycle. That's, that's a process that happens. Um, but it's not, it's not alive. Whereas, yeah. yeah, it's kind of looking at different sort of magnifications. Um, and life, I think the key point here is that life sort of, um, continues itself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, the the rest of the seven pillars. This one is perfect. It's compartmentalization. So <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so th this is what I was talking about earlier. That you've got a limited volume. That you've got a boundary that separates you mm. from not you. So I'm I'm you know I've got like each cell has a boundary. It's got its sort of um membrane mm -hmm. or it can have a cell wall um you've got a boundary your skin is a lovely boundary between you and mm. not you it is quite nice yes it's fantastic yeah. lovely lovely, lovely thing mm. um and you know there's there's all <laughs> <laughs> um and then even viruses have kind of got their uh their capsule they're sort of capsid which is yeah kind of a boundary between them and other things until they decide for it to not be and then they inject uh their RNA or their DNA into another organism. And that's the thing. Viruses are really interesting to me because like they really make you consider, well, what what is life? What mm. is alive? And and it gives you this sort of thing of, well, either a lot of things are alive, or life doesn't really either like either you can just say arbitrarily, viruses are where we draw the line, mm -hmm. or you can extend it out to viruses and draw the line after them. But then you've got to say, well, why did I draw that line? You realize that it's maybe a bit arbitrary. Mm -hmm. And then the definition of life kind of expands a little bit. It's it's interesting because not just uh, compartmentalization in terms of the simplest, uh, the simplest one, which is maybe a single cell that has a boundary between inside and outside. Mm. But also we are compartmentalized in uh, to sort of varying degrees. So you could say, okay, I'm a I'm a thing. I've got my mm. skin separating me from not me. Mm. Um, but then I also have inside of myself, I've got different organs and different membranes that separate different parts of me from different parts of me. True. And then if you even go down to the cellular level, uh, because we're eukaryotes, we're a kind of we're a kind of um, uh, organism called eukaryotes. Don't worry about what it is right now. You can <laughs> Google it if you want. Um, but because we are eukaryotes, we have. Uh, what are called organelles inside of our cells, which are mm -hmm. me like sort of little membrane-bound things inside of our cells that do specific jobs. So some some kinds of life don't have that, like bacteria don't have um, little little sort of, I guess, little sort of membrane-bound things inside their cells that do specific jobs, but we do. Mm -hmm. um, so even inside of our cells, we're compartmentalized, which I think is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's uh, that's his other pillar of life. The fourth pillar is energy. Um, so that's effectively uh, just the idea that um, you, you've got to be an open system uh, that can metabolize. And what I mean by an open system is uh, you can take basically you can take stuff in and expel stuff out. Um, because if you were a closed system, everything would be contained within you, right. sort of thing. If that, does that make sense? Yes. Mm. Okay. So an example of a closed system. A poor one is Earth. So in some close, so in some definitions wow. of the closed system, you can. That's your home, man. <laughs> <laughs> and it sucks. So with um with the Earth, it doesn't really gain much mass. It doesn't really lose much mass. You know, meteorites, some gases escaping out from the atmosphere. Um, and it does have energy coming in. So with some definitions of closed systems, um, you can have energy coming in and out. Um, th the key thing is there's no mass transfer, um, which is the case. Uh, for say um, a pot you have on the stove. There's not really any mass transfer, um, but there is some energy transfer. Basically the definitions of closed and open systems are kind of like, eh, it's one of those definitions that we kind of apply to stuff just for the sake of working with it. But in this context, think of an open system as something that exchanges both energy and mass um, outside of itself. So it's got a boundary between the inside and outside, but it can exchange energy and mass with the inside and outside. Like Luke, Luke um, exchanges I mass. And I poop. Yes, he does. 
And <laughs> that is all I do. It's all he does. Twenty four seven. And there is a boundary between Luke and not Luke. Apparently. Yeah. Okay, right. Very good. So <laughs> that would be compartmentalization. Uh, the fourth is energy. Um, yeah, again, um, we've already spoken about that. We had brought up energy. I got lost. So that is that is energy. The fact that there is sort of an open system that you, um, you sort of uh, need to metabolize stuff um, in order to have the energy that you need to move and live effectively, you know? Mm-hmm. So you can, mm-hmm. yeah, there's a, <laughs> there's a transfer of energy between yourself and the environment. That makes sense. So um, the fifth one is regeneration. So that is essentially, uh, if if you cut yourself, you regenerate. Yeah. Yes, as I heal. Yeah. So and there's also the thing is that Uh. and like and also the thing is that you lose skin cells and stuff, but you regenerate those. The Mm -hmm. idea is that effectively um, there are losses with life, but you can regenerate those losses by taking in things from the environment. Yeah? Yeah. Right. Um, and, and that's not really included in Mrs. Gren. It's not really. Not really taken. Well, it's kind of, nutrition is kind of there, but also mm. growth and, uh, yeah, that it's yeah. kind of there. Um, again, this they're all kind of describing roughly the same, they're describing the same thing. They're describing life. It's just mm-hmm. how you look at it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah, the thing is that, um, you you can't have a it, the the point of regeneration is that um, the strain that it takes to const- sort of to consistently um, have life happen over a long period of time <laughs> consistently have life happen um, <laughs> the strain that 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 um, that, that has on the materials mm. mean that those materials need to be um, sort of regenerated or replenished yeah. like if you were to have if you were to have sort of um, you know it's the same thing that we need to like sort of fix bridges or rebuild them because just them being used constantly means they'll break. I mean, all of your sort of cells are being renewed. Your blood cells are being renewed. In fact, I think in about eight years, you're in pretty much your entire body um, is um, completely new. Not all at once, but um, <laughs> <laughs> slowly over that period of time. Um, so that's that's kind of regeneration, the sort of remaking or rebuilding um, of parts that are sort of lost to the environment or degraded. So regeneration also includes um, basically replication um so if you think about it in a grander sense um you've you've got sort of you've got um a unit of life which is usually a cell but in this case let's say it's a person right you've got a person um and when their materials their materials will one day basically crap out they're not going to work forever and so in order to regenerate life they create an, a smaller one a smaller version that itself continues on the process of life and That's... when that one starts to get um bigger and it 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 sort of its its parts start to fail it will produce yeah. another one and another one and another one so that's that kind of replication um that is falls under regeneration in this um in this sort of description that's an interesting way of looking at regeneration yeah so as the whole yeah so, so as the as the older individuals of life die the new little, little baby the new little baby individuals are coming up yeah so yeah. this is this is what i'm saying about um looking at life on a grander scale so the sort of um the properties of life that you get taught, um, the sort of Mrs. Grand thing, that's mm. more um, on an individual. Is this thing alive? Yeah. Or is it not? These, what I like about um, these sort of seven pillars is it's really interesting because it it zooms out a little bit and it looks as looks at life as more of a a long a long term process. Yeah. Um, and uh, after regeneration, there's also adaptability. Now that's um, like like you were saying, Luke, um, improvisation. Um, doesn't really sound like it should be um it doesn't really sound like it should be evolution it's like the individual entity's um ability to improvise when the world's unexpected for example yeah it's yeah it's the much smaller scale so it's like um it's it's responding to stimuli like i said it's it's basically like examples that he uses are hunger and um one great one is put your hand in a fire now you can evolve um you can evolve the knowledge to not put your hand in a fire but at the, in the immediate sense like that kind of long-term improvisation is not going to help you. You need to have the adaptability to be able to sort of pull your hand mm-hmm. in the fire. So it's essentially kind of response to stimulus, like rolling with the punches, um, a short, a short-term improvisation. Um, and then the last one is uh, seclusion. So I guess in, in this one seclusion, I would kind of, um, that's, that's essentially the way that he describes this as being the fact that there are lots of, lots of chemical processes going on inside of you. And, 
if you were just just have things if if things weren't specific so i think seclusion could also be uh, spoken of as specificity so if mm -hmm. things weren't specific then there's kind of be chaos you've got lots of chemical reactions and the key part about those chemical reactions is that they're being run by sort of enzymes that are incredibly incredibly specific so that makes sure that the reactions that are supposed to be happening um aren't sort of interfering with one another now they can interfere with one another there's sort of like feedback loops and whatnot but mm -hmm. the, the the point is that you can separate um all of these reactions so that they can run at once. Because when you think about it, the number of chemical reactions that are going on inside of a cell is incredible. There are numerous, numerous chemical reactions. And if we were going to try and do that um, all in, say, a test tube, it'd be quite difficult. Mm. Um, so the, the key part of life is that you can have all of these different things going on at once, but they're all sort of secluded from each other. There's sort of, um, there's a, almost a separation due to specificity. Yeah. How is that different from compartmentalization? Compartmentalization is, I think, more a sort of physical, um, uh, it, that's compartmentalization is a sort of being a limited volume. So that's separating yourself from the outside. Seclusion is more about the reactions. So you can have, you can have compartmentalization aiding seclusion, but um, for example, uh, a single celled organism uh, that has no um, organelles or like basically um, little, little bits inside of it that are um, compartmentalized a single celled organism has compartmentalization basically between itself and the outside world and it also has seclusion in that it's got very specific um processes going on inside of it that don't um that don't interfere too much with each other yes i understand that but but when we talked about compartmentalization we were saying like i'm compartmentalized from the world through my skin mm -hmm. my liver is compartmentalized from my stomach because my liver has compartmentalization, has a boundary, and then my cells are compartmentalized from each other because they have a cell wall. And it's like, well, then, yes, inside the cells, those things, inside the bits inside the cells will be compartmentalized from each other as well, mm -hmm. um, like the mitochondria. So I don't understand what the difference is between there being things that are separated from other areas, like my skin separates me from the world, um, why that is different from seclusion because seclusion is within yourself um the sort of the almost separation of those chemical processes and the thing is that that's there is some overlap here between um sort of compartmentalization and seclusion as far okay. as i'm aware in okay. that um you can you can seclude chemical processes from one another one, from one another by compartmentalizing inside oneself but that is not yeah. a given for all like a compartmentalization i think the key point point to take away from comp compartmentalization is that there is a boundary between um the thing that is the sort of life itself and the outside whereas seclusion is within within the thing itself the chemical processes that are required um all happen sort of simultaneously without um great interference with one another and you can do that by compartmentalization but it's not um it's not necessary it's not strictly necessary yeah um, so those are the seven <laughs> pillars of life that um uh daniel koshland jr set out in 2002 and i think they were quite interesting so i thought we'd uh go through them but uh how did life form on earth because remember we were talking about life in a jar so we want to we're gonna just quickly run through how we think life might have started on earth so we can figure out why and how these scientists um supposedly managed to create life in a jar so oh you hadn't told us that yet you just told us life in a jar at the top yeah don't I think you told us sign it's nice scientists it. made it in a jar oh Ooh. yeah well i thought that you was... just gave us the teaser and it's oh, sometimes the teaser is a metaphor sometimes the teaser is a joke uh, and an hour later cool. <laughs> some scientists made life in a jar thank you cory for that information <laughs> i forgot i thought i said it i'm sorry yeah no scientists maybe well, you did maybe we weren't listening the thing is i don't want to say scientists made life in a jar because um there's I uh, we'll get to why right don't take away yeah. from this that scientists made life in a jar because that's not really it's not really what they did but um how did life form on earth uh, the reason that i said that scientists made life in a jar that's the sort of a tagline is because that's literally what they said on tiktok but yeah we'll get yeah. to we'll okay. get to debunking that in a bit so how did life form on earth we're not entirely sure we don't know no we don't know uh, we have a starting point um what an idea of what the starting point was like and we know what the ending point is because it's right now but uh, <laughs> well, it hasn't happened yet has it no no the current end point. this is as far as we've gotten yeah, the, yeah. you know the present yeah. um so the thing is basically figuring out how abiotic um non-alive molecules became biotic sort of self-replicating alive molecules 
how did you get from a bunch of stuff on a planet to a bunch of stuff on a planet that makes more stuff on that planet, you know? Because what are we if not a bunch of stuff that makes more of that same stuff? <laughs> so abiogenesis um, is something we're going to talk about really briefly. It's basically the idea of non-living chemicals becoming living chemicals. So you might have heard of the um, operin Haldane theory. I say that. No, probably haven't. Uh, basically, two scientists in the 1920s independently came up with a very similar theory. So both of them believed that organic molecules um, could basically come from um, abiotic uh, molecules. So they both believed the stuff that is necessary for living things, for self-replicating molecules to come about, um, could come from non-living molecules. Um, and the way that would happen would be... Um, sort of energy from uh, outside of that system. So uh, for example, uh, lightning, ultraviolet radiation, um, any other kind of radiation really, um, or intense heat or pressure from the... Um, from the volcanoes under the sea. Yeah, exactly. Hydrothermal vents, uh, undersea volcanoes. Um, and if the atmosphere um, had very little sort of oxygen um, and had a lot of uh, ammonia and uh, water, um, well, water vapor, um, then it could you could kind of have all of these molecules that you need for life coming from those starting conditions. Now, um, they thought that what they thought was that the first uh, living things came from sort of warm oceans where um, basically there were a bunch of nutrients and so kind of chemicals came together and they kind of over time. Mm came into the sort of correct, correct position to sort of replicate themselves and that kind of evolved into living things. That's sort of the idea of um, primordial soup. You guys you guys have heard of primordial yeah. soup, right? Yeah. Like replicators. Like yeah. lots of just self-replicating things all mushed together, attacking each other. <laughs> and now you realize that my reference to soup at the top of the show I see. makes sense. Right. Um, <laughs> so what, what you're saying is that at some point the sea was a soup. Oh my god! So that's not really not what we anymore. think. Maybe I'm we're cutting, all soup. I'm cutting you off. That's not really what we think now, though. Um, <clears throat> the core idea is still there. The idea that uh, non-living chemicals became living chemicals, but uh, that's that. The kind of specifics aren't really there. We know that um, we've got a pretty solid idea that the the ideas they had for the atmosphere and conditions at the start of Earth weren't they weren't really accurate. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and we also. They kind of thought, as I said, that it was sort of like warm oceans where life sort of started. But we now have a better idea and we think that it's more likely that it's sort of hydrothermal vents or deep in the earth um, where there's sort of hydrogen and I think ammonia um, down there uh, to sort of uh, start and sustain life. So there are two main schools of thought on this and the difference between them is basically what they think came first. So there is sort of the metabolism and the reproduction. Those are the two different ones. One of one sort of school of thought believes metabolism came first, and the other one believes reproduction came first. Now, I'll explain that a little bit more in depth, but bear in mind, this is incredibly broad. There are different theories within those two sort of broad groups, um, and even sort of outside those. So basically, there were proto-organisms that could utilize or produce energy, and then they developed reproduction. So that's basically like... Um, not even, don't even think of like a bacteria. Think of more prim primitive than that. Mm. It could basically make energy um, or sort of utilize energy to produce more energy. And then they developed the ability to sort of reproduce. Mm. That's the, that's the um, metabolism first. And okay. then there's reproduction first. And that's the idea that there were sort of molecules that could reproduce. So sort of chemicals that could make more of the same chemical. Um, and then they developed sort of a housing and a metabolism. So they developed after replicating for a while, they somehow developed um, a sort of capsule for themselves mm -hmm. and then a way to produce energy. So those are the two main schools of thought. And that's very sort of basic. Basically either stuff found out how to make energy and then it started to reproduce or stuff started to reproduce and then found out how to sort of have a house and make energy. And we don't know which one's true. We, yeah, we don't. we don't. We know very little about this. This is yeah, all... Yeah. Um, it's, it's very difficult because it was a long, long time ago and it, it's... It, it's tough to really figure it out because it happened over a long period of time and there's mm -hmm. there's so much uncertainty there. Yeah. Uh, but we are obviously we're getting closer as we as we study it more and more. Um and again, like we're not sure how it started, but we are uh pretty confident that basically life arose from non-living molecules that are sort of spontaneously spurred on by conditions the conditions of the young earth. So yeah, basically non-living stuff became living stuff 
because of how things were way back then, but we're not mm. entirely sure exactly how. We've, we've got a broad idea, but we're not sure how. Uh, so uh, before we get into like the actual study, I just want to briefly run over um, a couple things with you. Uh, you might have heard of them already. They're amino acids and nucleic acids. Yeah? Yep. You heard of them? So um, amino acids, those are the building blocks of proteins. There are about 20 that you need to make all of the proteins in a human and pretty much every other form of life, but there are lots, lots more amino acids than that. Um, and specifically, an amino acid is um, any of sort of uh, a group of organic molecules. And what what sort of defines them from, um, sets them apart from everything else, is they've got um, an amino group, NH2, um, an acidic carboxyl group, uh, COOH, um, and then an organic group um, or like a side chain. And that's what sort of differentiates each amino acid. So basically with an amino acid, you've got a carbon in the middle. It's connected to um, the sort of uh, amino group. That's the NH. A hydrogen, um, a carboxylic sort of acid group. And then it's got another group that is unique to each, each one. That's what sort of differentiates them. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, essentially these these sort of amino acids put up together make proteins. So depending on the amino acid that you've got basically in the chain, it can make sort of different properties for different proteins. So the sequence of amino acids uh, determines what the structure and function of a protein is. We've mm -hmm. spoken about this a little bit before. It's not hugely important to understand exactly how it works. All you need to know for this is that amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. If you put amino acids together, then you, get, um, you can get a protein. And a protein can be anything like an enzyme or basically like any of the things like collagen, mm -hmm. um, the sort of structural protein that's in your, in your body. Um, enzymes, which are basically, um, catalysts, they help reactions happen. Yeah. Um, all of those things. So proteins are really important for life, obviously, and they're made from amino acids. And then you've got nucleic acids, which are DNA and RNA. So we know what DNA and RNA are. They're sort of the blueprints. They're the sort of code for life. And like I said, RNA is, can be used by, um, it's used in our cells. Um, to sort of um, replicate, to sort of replicate um, and make proteins. However, it's also used in viruses, just as their sort of genetic code. Mm. So both are incredibly important across basically all forms of life. Uh, but nucleic acids are made up of um, so they're long chains, but they're made up from nucleotides. So nucleotides are basically just a sugar connected to um, another group um, and a phosphorus usually doesn't really again doesn't really hugely matter if you understand what they're made up of mm -hmm. but um basically nucleic acids are made up of nucleotides so if you've got nucleotides you can chain them up together to make a nucleic acid and nucleic acids are the sort of backbone of life yeah. on earth really yeah um so the life in the jar study so in 1952 there was a man named stanley miller um, and I'm sure there's a man named Stanley Miller now. But in 1952, there was a specific man named Stanley Maybe Miller. Maybe more than one. So Stanley Miller was basically a graduate student um, at the University of Chicago. Um, and he wanted to do a study. Um, and so he went to uh, a man named Yuri, Harold Yuri, uh, And they basically started an experiment together. The idea was uh, to use... Um, it, not a jar, it was more complex than that, but to use a closed system and simulate the initial sort of um, conditions of Earth. Mm. So essentially what they did was they um, they had this custom-built apparatus that they filled with gases that they thought would be at the start of the Earth, mm. some water vapor in there as well, some water to be sort of like the oceans, and they started giving it electric shocks. Um, and something condensed on the electrode. So basically something was created. Um, and the things that were, that were created were um, like molecules that could be sort of precursors for life. And this was pretty much the first time that someone had done this, that someone mm. had made um, molecules sort of that could be used for life or um, molecules necessary for life. Um, they produced them from uh, an environment that was at the time thought to be similar to primitive earth, essentially. Mm. Um, and, that wasn't the that wasn't the only time they did that. So that was the first time. That was in 1952. I think it was published in 1953. And then in uh, 1958, Stanley Miller uh, sort of did the same experiment again, um, uh, or very similar. Basically, he electrified um, a mixture of gases again uh, to sort of mimic the atmosphere. Um, but apparently, um, the, he just didn't finish. He just didn't sort of look at the results for this. He collected all of the samples, he stored them, he wrote down like sort of 
everything in his note in his notes in his sort of uh, science little science book. But he didn't uh, publish it. He didn't actually study it. He didn't look at the results. Not entirely what? sure why. Weird. Um, yeah, it's very strange. But um, he basically just he just left them um, apparently just in a box for um, a long, long time. Uh, for gosh, like years, uh, 50, 49 years, 50, 49, 50 years. <laughs> yeah, no, wow. ridiculous, right? Um, but um, he he died in um, 1999 of a stroke. Um, and in his will, I suppose, he left this equipment, all of this stuff, all of these vials that he'd collected, all of his notes to um, Jeffrey Bada. Um, and that was someone that um, that was someone that had studied under him. So yeah. he left all of his stuff with Je uh, with uh, Jeffrey Bada. Um, and then Bada then was like, well, why don't we look at this? Have a little look-see. And so they did. Um, and inside, of all those vials and looking at all those notes, they found um, mm. they found a bunch, like a bunch of amino acids, which you guys know are the building blocks of proteins, and so quite important for life. And what's really interesting, what was really interesting about that was that um, that this so this all happened in um, this happened in two thousand seven that he um, that he sort of decided to start doing this. So um, t over fifty years after the initial experiment, um, they find they found the results that were actually quite um, quite interesting that um you could effectively produce amino acids from those starting conditions that they had in that flask through electricity <clears throat> and so he looked when he looked at initially uh, miller he, he found um he sort of found um five different amino acids so that was the, the sort of first time he found five amino acids mm. um and Long after, obviously, 50, 50 odd years later, there were much more sensitive um, methods for sort of finding things in the sort of methods of um, measurement. Mm -hmm. uh, we could find out what was in there much more accurately than we could before. And we found uh, way more than those five. We, I think we found like 20 amino acids, um, way more than, than, initially, than initially thought. Um, and I think it was 20, that was 23. Um, amino acids that wow. we find in the vials, which is which is brilliant. And so there were a lot more there than he initially thought. And the idea behind this is that effectively what they had shown was mm. that in those specific conditions, you could produce biological molecules, which is really great. That's a wow. So that's kind of that kind of lends credence to the idea that life, the process of life, can come yeah. from basically dead, non living molecules. Um. And so obviously this sounds amazing that they basically created life in a jar um, through just shocking it, you know, with... Yeah. Well. Yeah, well. <laughs> they made the biological precursors for life yeah, in a jar. Right, I'm glad you said that Ooh, because that's, yeah. that was exactly... That's like saying you made you made a house when you made some bricks. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. Just a big pile <laughs> of bricks. Exactly, so that that is exactly it. And I'm really glad you guys said that because, um, yeah, no, that, that was my thought when I was watching this TikTok. You remember, this is all where that came from. I saw this TikTok yeah. that said, oh, they did this. So I looked into it and well, they didn't really create life. And, you know, there are more sort of, um, there are more flaws with this experiment than than just that. You can't really say they created life. They created precursors to life and not even necessarily precursors to life. They created building blocks of life. Mm. You know, it's not like they made a builder. They made the bricks. Mm. And the thing is that if you'd asked people that um, you know, nowadays that have studied the Earth's atmosphere, like the Earth's atmosphere or early Earth's atmosphere, mm. you'll find out that actually the conditions that they had to begin with weren't really great. As in the, the, what they had in the bottle was not a really great simulation of mm. what the Earth would have been like. and shocking with that electricity isn't really a good way to simulate lightning there are a lot of different problems with it um especially now if, if you consider the fact that um we think that we, there is a prevailing there is a prevailing theory there's many theories but there's um particularly one that life came from sort of hydrothermal vents this doesn't really this doesn't really show that so much and again the sort of the gate the, the mixture of gases that they had um was just not right at all. Um, so if you were to do it with a more realistic mixture of gases, apparently it'd be much more difficult to to produce the same results. Mm. I was going to ask about this, about whether, you know, because you're you're making, uh, you're, you're starting with, with what you hope to have 
to proof. And there's a plenty of possibility there that your selection for which gases you put in the atmosphere that began that were there in the start of life that you claim were there at the start of life that turned out to probably be not accurate. Mm. Um, maybe you th- those gases is, it, whether this actually works or not is so dependent on which gases you choose to say mm-hmm. begin uh, or at the beginning of the Earth. And if just because you proved that doesn't mean that your starting conditions were actually anything to do with what was actually there at the beginning of the Earth. Yeah, exactly. So in order to prove this is sort of to do this well, you need to have an accurate idea of what the starting conditions were like. Be- this is the thing. Um, if you were to, this is it's, it's quite funny. If you're going to work backwards from what you've got and be like, oh, these must have been the starting conditions, and then try to start from those to make it, of course you're going to prove yourself right. Mm. Um, yes, that's what I mean. Yeah. And now that we we've got a better idea of sort of the starting conditions, um, yeah, it's it's not necessarily as powerful an experiment as it once was but it does it does definitely show something it shows that sort of biological molecules used in biology sort of biological molecules can be produced um almost spontaneously from mm, yes. from those materials they can form on their own yes. yeah now granted they're if it's in a lightning storm they're likely going to be destroyed by lightning or ultraviolet radiation before they have any chance to do anything which is why we think uh hydro- hydrothermal vents were um one of the the ways that life started because you've got water which is mm-hmm. essential um you've got it could get trapped they could get trapped in small pockets mm-hmm. which means that um all of the all of the stuff necessary for life can build up um and you've got the heat so that you've got the energy um You've got protection from radiation, so it, you don't have anything necessarily um, destroying mm-hmm. uh, those molecules that are being made. So th- that kind of gives you an idea of like what the conditions would need to be. You'd need to kind of have an accumulation of all these molecules. You need to have it be have energy coming in, but not so much that it destroys the molecules. Mm-hmm. And you need to have some sort of aqueous mixture. It needs to be in water. So it it, it yeah, that's kind of the idea that we've got right now. Um, and yeah, I mean, like, the thing about this experiment is that it's it's not necessarily, it's not really how life formed. You can't look at this experiment and be like, this is how life formed on Earth, despite the fact that that's probably what you'll read when you hear about this experiment. It's definitely what I had to wade through a lot when I was looking at it. Um, and I think it's just, I think it just is interesting to me that it's so easy to spread that kind of stuff on TikTok. Because if I hadn't been the kind of person that's, that sort of thinks, well, I'm going to look this up. Like I don't hmm. yeah. like pretty much pretty much whatever I hear, I'm like, I'm gonna look that up. Um even even from people that I've even from trusted people. So like if like we've we mentioned Hank Green earlier, right? He's he's very good on his sources and stuff, but if some mm-hmm. if I hear something from him and I'm like, come on, I'll look it up. <laughs> Which is I think is a good thing because <laughs> even if even uh, you know, even if he's a hundred percent even if he's a hundred percent right, like ninety eight percent of the time, there's still that two percent of the time that he may maybe may, may mm-hmm. you know might make a mistake. And that's the same for all. That's the same for us as well, which is why we have those corrections. And I just think that it's um, it's a case of you need to be really careful of where you get your information, and you need to be really careful about fact checking your information because this all sounds plausible. You know, yeah. sort of they basically made life in a jar um, because they kind of did. You're just not getting all the information. Yeah, they they made the precursor of life in a jar. Uh, they made the precursor of life in a jar using starting conditions that weren't necessarily present at the start of life. So it's, really, it's uh, you know, um, but no, I, I thought it was a really interesting experiment and there have been other experiments. Uh, there was one particular that I looked at that um, apparently um, used a more accurate representation of the sort of primordial earth. And um, they managed to produce um, a sort of nucleotides, um, basically the, the building blocks of um the building blocks of DNA, they managed to produce sort of building blocks of RNA. Um, they managed to produce those under a similar experiment, which I thought was very interesting. But again, there haven't been any sort of major, major breakthroughs on this in quite a while since that um, since that thing that happened in 2007, since they basically mm-hmm. looked at the the results after 50 odd years. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to bring this, I wanted to bring up this story mostly because um, I thought it was an interesting thing that I saw on TikTok and I always like looking into interesting things like that. But also just, again, as another little sort of cautionary tale of be careful what you, be careful where you get your information and fact check everything. Not everything, but yeah. you know, fact check. If something sounds sort of um, sensational or almost too good, too good to be true or mm. just incredible, 
All it takes is just maybe a, a quick Google search. Just Even just slightly so. Yeah. Because I feel like the life in a jail thing is just plausible enough yeah. that people will just take it at face value and leave it. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I read it and I was like, but, mm, yeah, that seems like knowing what I know, which is not a huge amount. I'm not trying to say I know a lot. Um, but knowing what I know, that sounds plausible. Mm -hmm. But I'm not entirely convinced. But how likely? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So looking into it is always is always a good thing to do. Uh, but no, that is the story for this week. That is the life in a jar study uh, oh, wow. from uh, Stanley Miller. That that's the Yuri Miller experiment. <laughs> uh, if you want to look into that. Uh, but yeah, what do you guys think? Should we continue trying to make life in a jar? I think yeah, we, we need to go past the precursors. I think creating life is something that we could be getting closer and closer and closer to doing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we do it pretty much all the time. It's very easy. In fact, it's one of the easiest things in the world to make life. But um, you know. I, in the sense of making non-human new life using sort of, um, I guess. Planting a seed. Yeah, that's, well, mm. that's more just kind of helping life to grow. Make more, itself. It? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's like saying sitting on a, sitting on an egg, you know, and hatching it. That's, that's making oh, you like squashing it. What are you no. saying? What are you saying about hens, Cory? No, I'm talking about a human doing it. The hen has made the egg. <laughs> Uh, okay. The head is put in the work there. That's okay. That's like, um, that's like someone giving birth. You taking the baby, raising it for a bit, and saying, "I made this." I made it. <laughs> <laughs> you bloody well did it, right? You well, if it. you wait seven years, then all the cells and materials have re re replaced themselves. <laughs> then technically, <laughs> you did. <laughs> okay, but okay, maybe, maybe no. But I, I think. <laughs> So actually, I'll do a quick shout out here. If you check out, um, I did a video on my on my good friend uh, Spice Eight Rack's channel. Um, should be linked in the description. I, I hope that's that's kind of the that was kind of the inspiration for this because he asked me a question in that video um, about sort of whether you could create life from just parts. And I looked into it a lot, and there was a lot of interesting stuff. And this was one of the this was um, one of the things I found after um, watching that TikTok. So I think we. I think we possibly could sort of make life. We have made mm. living organisms with uh, a living organism with completely sort of synthetic DNA. Like mm. we've made up its entire DNA um, sort of um, its genome. We made up its entire genome and we yeah. got them replicating. So we we're so we're getting close to actually making life um, from scratch, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. But it is now time for the <gasps> quick fire quiz. Dun, 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 dun. <gasps> so as you both know, I will ask you both one question between you. I have to finish asking the question before you can buzz in to answer. The first person to buzz in gets to answer the question. Whoever gets the question right wins. Those are all the rules, I think. Who, what is your, where, when, why is your buzzer? Jam, very good one. Uh, Luke, what is what is your buzzer? <laughs> it's a really cute sound. So my question for you, wow, that was really painful to listen to both of them. <laughs> my question for both of you is, can you name an amino acid? Luke. Tryptophan. Oh, yeah, good job. Philanamine. You know, that was close enough. I'm actually going to give both of you points because you tried really hard. Phenolamine. 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 You sound like Finding Nemo trying to say that. Phenolamine. 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 Yeah. Phenolamine. No, I was just... I wanted to say lean at the end. It's not lean. For those of you not watching... Um, I, the reason I laughed is Jap had this amazing, <laughs> amazing movement of his mouth. He took so much care to really enunciate every every syllable. Imagine a really strained face as you can see the neurons striking together. Yeah, just a heads up, guys. <laughs> uh, well, actually, I'm proud of both of you for getting that. Because Thank I, you. I did lay it out very hard that I was going to be asking that question. But also, when I say, can you name an amino acid? You can just say no. That would have been a correct answer. Oh, no. Yeah. Or I could have said yes. That is the end of the Quick Fire Quiz. And actually, that's the end of our show. But before we go, we'd like to thank all of our patrons with a very special thanks to executive producer Ashley Muller. <gasps> and also a very new, very special executive producer whose name I'm going to read right now. A little build up, a please. new executive Perhaps producer? Who give us a little be? bit of a drum roll. It is Jawahir A. Thank you very Hi. much. Thank you.
thank you all for watching. You can find the full references for this episode in the description. Subscribe for new episodes every Sunday. And why not leave us a nice wee comment? You can support the pod at patreon.com forward slash SciGuys. Or you can find and contact us at SciGuysPod on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, and TikTok too. Or you can send us an email at SciGuysPod at gmail.com. You can find me at NotCore everywhere. You can follow me at Jamkin everywhere. You can follow me at Luke Cupforth everywhere. Uh, goodbye. Uh, goodbye. Goodbye.